I got friends only wanna talk business. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I've been reading all the war. And I've been shutting down the stars. Yeah, cause when it rain and it pours. Yeah, and I'm ready for some more. Yeah, and I've been reading all the war. Welcome to this episode of Put That Coffee Down, the Freight Cell Show. And today we have an exciting, exciting episode for you. It's all about selling on reputation. My name's Kevin Hill, and as always, I'm here with the Dooner. How are you doing today? The Freight Sales Podcast for Closers, Kevin Hill. I'm doing great. What's up, brother? It's going great. It is going great. We've been t- having a, a great conversation. I, I think everyone's watching the the, the Dune the, the Dune trailer that's just dropping right now. That's been the conversation behind the scenes. Well, you know what? They said they filmed Borat, too, and I was talking to our production team in the back, and I was like, how could Borat? You know, we're talking about reputation. Borat obviously has a reputation. You'd think he's world-renowned, right? And it's like, how, how could you trick him with Borat? But it turns out one of our production guys in the back has never even seen Borat. Borat? I, is that part of Dune? Because I've never seen Dune. I almost watched it this weekend, but I didn't watch it. Okay, apparently there's still a few people, <laughs> Borat. Kevin Hill being one of them. We got to make a correction, by the way. So during yesterday, last week's show, we were trying to talk about, uh, we we're trying to talk to Haley. As I said at the time, Fazio. And I couldn't understand what I was saying wrong. And it was my, uh, my stressor. So it's actually Fazio. So Haley Fazio, I am sorry for uh, getting your name wrong. You know, you'd think after a year and a half, I could. I could get that one right, Kevin Hill. Uh, you, you would think so. I think it's that Boston accent, though. You, you, you say Fazio. You say, you say the as and not the Oz like the, the Italians. So here we go. Sheena Dave says, good morning. Tamara Jackson says, good morning, all. Kenneth Carter the third says, this is the, one of the most anticipated shows for him. Patty is here. Aaron uh, Smeetak. Kevin Hill hasn't seen Borat. Emily is laughing at you. Kevin, actually, I have a funny story before we move on on Borat. So when I used to work as a broker, talking about reputation, broker's reputations, I worked at FedEx Trade Networks with this Brazilian guy named Haviland. And he, uh, he, he, he comes in one day. He's looking all disheveled. He looked like he didn't get any sleep. And I was like, hey, what's wrong, Haviland? And he goes, by the way, peace out, Haviland, if you're, if you're checking this out. But he goes, uh, yeah, you know, for family movie night, I rented Borat from the Red Box, and I played it, and then my wife kicked me out of the house. So... Kevin, you wouldn't get that joke because you haven't watched Borat, but I implore you well, to. That, uh, are we talking about Sebastian Cohen, Cohen's character? You know, it's not Sebastian. It's Sasha Baron Cohen. Sasha Baron Cohen. I, I'm close if enough. You any deeper. Paul Cameron says you haven't watched Dune. Shameful. We're not talking about Dune here, though. We're talking about Borat, Pat, Paul. I, I thought um, I, I didn't understand that Borat was, was that character. I, yeah, I've seen Borat. I thought you're still talking about Dune. I mean, all okay. the production guys, that's all they can talk about is Dune. I thought we were still on the Dune theme. No, no, I was talking about Borat. Um, all right, oh, so yeah, I've ad- seen Borat. Okay, good. Okay, so that's what I was talking about. My, my buddy at work, he rented it for family movie night, thinking it was like a family comedy. <laughs> and he said, 10 minutes later, I was sleep in the car. He actually slept in the parking lot, I think, at FedEx Trade Networks. <laughs> Came in the next day. Uh, I think everything eventually got resolved. But, uh, you know, check the rating before you bring home uh, a movie like uh, a Borat. You know, it end up I, 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 yeah, yeah, definitely check the rating before Borat. Okay. All right, man. So today's show, let's skip the band. Today's show, this month's Put That Coffee Down is supported by Hubtech. Hubtech just launched Tabby, a new task automation bot that helps you focus on what matters. To learn more, visit GoHubtech.com. Yes. Boom. 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 Just share this out too. By the way, Rob Boosie, thanks for joining us too. Got a lot of a lot of gangs showing up today. They uh, they checked out your video. They checked out my post. Glad you guys are here. We're gonna we're gonna dive deep on all this stuff. But a little bad marketing first. This one's about hijacking. So this is what people do sometimes. You know, you got marketing companies, you got promotion companies. They they see that there's some pretty good deals out here, right? In terms of the digital marketing space, but you can hurt your brand reputation if you try to take advantage of the system. And what happened here was that Burger King has sparked criticism for running an ad campaign that hijacked fan messages on Twitch and turned it into a cheap ad platform to reach gamers. So Kevin, what happened here is like, if we had an option that people could tip us a dollar and then we would read their comments online, we, uh, we're more judicious. We'll read your comment for free if it makes sense. But what they did, Burger King, they went out and they, they spent all this money, you know, they spent a dollar at a time and trying to make these Twitch streamers read their Burger King ads. And it really, really upset the community. 
Sometimes you'll see people filter in here too. They'll try to put like an ad for their brokerage or something mm -hmm. like right during the middle of a show. It doesn't work. So you got to be careful with that, with that post hijacking. Have you seen a good example of that before? You know, I, I don't think I've seen a, a good example of it, but this is a very interesting article because, you know, you, you're basically advertising for like a, a dollar, you know, instead of paying this this rich premium to, to advertise Burger King specials, you're, you're trying to trick uh, Twitch users into to reading your comments for, I think it was, what, two pounds 50 or about five bucks uh, as well. And uh, it really backfired. I mean, basically, the, the Twitchers were, were just dogging Burger King whenever whenever those ads popped up. Yeah, no, I know. And it, 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 it upset the community. You got to be careful with those kind of things when you're, if you're on the, the marketing side, be careful. You know, you don't want to turn the guns on yourself and you don't want to take advantage of these strong communities. We talked about building these strong network communities before. And then like these Twitch streamers, they have a lot of hold over the people that watch them as do a lot of live streamers. So you take advantage of that. They're going to start, you know, you know, doing the to your brand. So be careful yeah, out good. there. Yeah, it's going to backfire on you because basically you're trying to get in, in front of these influencers or, or Twitchers, right? And if if they start dogging you, if they if they don't like you, then it, it can all backfire on you. It can hurt your reputation. Yeah, I mean, and their whole uh, their whole complaint here is that look, you're a real big company. This is predatory marketing. You're taking advantage of a system that's designed for you know people who are actually watching the feed, not trying to promote brands. So. Uh, just be careful with that kind of stuff. By the way, here's a quote for today's show or a couple yeah. of quotes. This is actually from a, a listener, Eric Serta, who's in the comments right now. And this was a great one. And I think he yes. wrote it during the midday market update last Thursday. He said, as a broker in April, every carrier thought I was the scum of the earth. And now every shipper thinks I'm the scum of the earth. I know. I love this quote. I mean, Serta, he he nailed it. You know, you're the middleman. You're the broker. One side of the the, the transactions probably not going to like the, the the deal. You just have to live with it. But yeah, I mean, with with 2020 and the volatility in the market in April, man, the, the carriers were protesting. You know, under a dollar a mile, you were you were scum. You you needed to be regulated. And now you don't hear anything from the carriers because they're getting a really good price. But now the shippers are pushing back, saying that, you know, you're robbing them. Kenneth Carter had a, another great quote uh, about that dynamic, dynamic as well that I think we have here somewhere, don't we? Uh, maybe down in the shout outs. Okay. You don't see it in front of you. It's not there, Mr. Kevin Hill, unless you remember it from your own mind up there. I, 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 I think I do remember it. It's... Uh, you, you can't control the market, but you can control your brand. And I don't think that's exactly right, but we'll get to the right quote here in a second. Yeah. All right. Uh, so here's another one. Here's one from one of my favorite movies. And it goes, when it comes to your work reputation, you can't unring the bell. And that's from the great character, Louis Bloom in Nightcrawler. You're exactly right. You know, basically it takes, uh, I think Buffett also has, has a quote about this too. You know, it takes years to build up your reputation. It takes one instance to just to destroy it. So you always have to be in guard. You know, I, I think Burger King, you could probably write a book about Burger King's marketing flops and, and marketing controversies. Uh, and, and maybe that's one of the reasons why they're, they're so behind McDonald's. Maybe it could be the, the, the food itself. Who knows? But, uh, you know, you have to be very, very cautious about your brand and very protective on it. And here is one from Evan Cord. He says, Dooner, loving the beard today, sir. That's a great one. I, I gave it a nice brushing, you know, put a little oil in it. So it's doing good. Only use coconut oil, you know, the natural stuff, the unrefined. You don't want to use the one. No, you got to get the refined. You don't want the one that smells like coconut or else you're walking around smelling like a pina colada or something. You got to get the uh, refined one. You get big tubs of it on, um, on Amazon.com. Just a, a hot tip for you. Here's one. Here's another quote. I don't give a damn about my reputation. Never said I wanted to improve my station. That is the wonderful Joan Jett. She didn't want to improve her station, so she didn't give a damn about her reputation. So don't follow her example. Follow ours today because we're going to tell you why. Kevin, why do you think it's a good idea, right, to work on improving your reputation in a market like this? Because right now, I mean, your brand is 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 what you trade on. Is is what differentiates you from everyone else out there, and your brand has to stand for something. And that's your company brand, that's your personal brand, that's your business brand. It's how you conduct yourself. So I mean, right now it's a hot market and a very volatile market. So as I said, we are the middleman. If you're a freight broker, you are the middleman, and everyone loves to hate the middleman. So uh, you. You have to, to really protect that brand because there's a lot of uh, shady characters out there who will take advantage of these uh, situations. 
Sales Hot Gym. Here's one. This is this is one I've read on LinkedIn. Some people have been doing this one, and I, I jumped ahead of it. But I, this is this one's worth mentioning. But let me know what you think about this. So, some people have been recommending on LinkedIn. A lot of people have been getting in-mail spam, so they're like putting emoticon before your name. So then, when you get the spam in your inbox, you will know immediately that it is spam. Do you think that's worthwhile, Kevin? Are you willing to hurt your brand or or enhance your brand by putting emoticon in front of your name to fight the spam? Yeah. How does that really fight the spam? I don't. I don't really follow that. Okay, so there, I think the thinking there is that uh, they're automatic. You know, LinkedIn Navigator automatically pulls the names of people when they're sending you something. It automatically populates that field. So the idea would be that since someone's using the emoticon in front of your name, they haven't taken time to actually type out oh, your okay. name. But at the same time, maybe they're just being respectful. Like if you have a lamb or a donkey or something in front of you, remember a bell or a coffee cup? I maybe that's part of your name. You know, I what do I know? It's twenty twenty. Maybe it is. I mean, I, I can tell spam from the, the first sentence. I, I, the first sentence. I, I, I can tell if it's spam or not. So I don't really have a problem with, I, I don't need a Mojicon. I I'm going to get spam no matter what, right? So uh, who cares? I, I can judge from the, the, the first couple sentences, and that's about all I read on, on, on most things anyway. So how about you? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I don't see Mojicons in, in your name. Well, I'd, like I just said, I, you know, I, I don't have any emoticons in my name, but if I did and someone didn't use them, maybe I'd be like, hey, why aren't they respecting my, uh, my emoticons? You know? Is it emoticons uh, or emojicons? Um, emojis. Emojicons, Kevin. You got me this time. I, I know, right? <laughs> All right, man, let's get into the topic, though. So in the comments, what are some negative things, listeners? What are some negative things for those of you in the comments that you've heard about brokers? Here's some that I've heard. They're, they're unreliable. They're untrustworthy. They're just loyal, Kevin. They're shady. What have you heard? I've heard they're price gougers. I've heard they're double dealers. I've heard that they're charlatans. I've heard that there's skullduggery going on around here. Scum. <laughs> scum. Middlemen. They're, sc <laughs> they're scum. They're middlemen. You've heard all the names in the book. And the thing is, when you're the broker, you get them piled on from all sides. So depending on the market, like, like Eric Serta said, and that's why we led with his quote, uh, back in April, the end of March, uh, when we hit that freight cliff, you are the scum of the earth to all those carriers. They're not moving that freight. They're not pulling for 89 cents a mile. They're going to the White House. They're getting that bag of MAGA hats, you know, all of that kind of stuff. They're going to, they want regulation. They need you guys mm -hmm. taking care of it. Suddenly crickets, right? Suddenly crickets because oh, yeah. the market, the market's good. But now the shippers are like, you scumbag, you, <laughs> you, you double dealer. What kind of margin are you putting on this? I know, right? It's, it's just the fact of life of being the middle man. Everyone loves to hate the middle man. And that's what we are as, as freight brokers. So, uh, and, and we don't control the market. As Kenneth Clark says, uh, we don't control the market. You know, if the market's up right now, you know, the market is really hot right now. We don't control the pricing. You know, it's all supply and demand fundamentals. Back in April, when, when loads were going for under a dollar a mile, it wasn't because freight brokers were pricing it at under a dollar a mile. The market was pricing it. We were just tacking on a little bit of our margin. We weren't trying to, most of us, I guess, except for the charlatans out there, uh, weren't trying to uh, really dig in because, I mean, every, you know, freight brokers out there were hurting too. But, you know, the, there's the, the old phrase, you know, don't shoot the messenger. But people love to shoot the messenger, and we are kind of the, the messengers of the market. In the comments, some people hear these, these are, and this, isn't this great, guys? Isn't this isn't this freeing a little bit? We've we've all been brokers. A lot of you are currently brokers, and we can we can excise this demon of the mean things we've heard. And some of you are doing that in the comments. Eric Serta says they aren't looking to build relationships. Amanda Miller says desk jockey. Kenneth Carter III says they make forty percent profit. Kelly Mansfield is uh, laughing about skull dudgery. Corey Albert says I've heard that brokers get sixty five percent off each load. Uh, Rhonda says they only care about the buck. Robert Boosie says we react to the market. Although is that a diss reacting to the market? I mean, that's kind of the that's kind of the gig, man. It's a market-based gig. Yeah. Uh, not all brokers are shysters. Uh, Aaron Smee Texas, that would actually be something nice, right? Uh, kids of divorce <laughs> probably make very good brokers. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, Jason Eckert, they they're full of tomfoolery. Uh, and then Tom brace. Man operates both ways. Yeah. So everyone here, we've all we've all heard the insults, and, and you know a lot of them are earned, right? A lot of times 
Reputation is earned. And the reason why, and the reason why we're talking about this, and the reason why there's no better time to talk about reputation is now is a great time for you to reform it with shippers, right? You look at that DHL pricing power supply chain index. It's at an 85. The pricing power is all the way in the carriers. And this, this is true of both markets on both sides when you're a broker. You can do a lot to enhance your relationship when the market is in unfavorably positioned. So instead of completely you know, taking advantage of potential customers, customers that are in Salesforce and your CRM, those calls that you have made, now is a great time to be like, hey, look, we can find you some of that capacity. We can find you some space. This is a relationship I've wanted to build for a while. I'm very familiar with your lanes. You know, you just haven't closed the deal yet. Now is a great time to come in, step in and offer to help out. It is, and it's the most important time, actually, because the market is so hot, spot rates are going up. So whether you're moving contracted freight or spot freight, that you know, you've had pretty consistent pricing, pricing is going up, and you have to find a way to show that you show your customers, show your shippers that you aren't ripping them off, that you aren't a charlatan, that you aren't doing some skullduggery around here, right? And you're going to have to have these conversations. You probably already have started these conversations, so it is a very important important um, aspect of of what we're living at, in today, the, these volatile times, that these conversations are going to take, take, take place. If they haven't already, they're going to continue taking place. So you better have your messaging clear because you're going to go in asking for, for price increases for, for the most part right now. True story. You know, there's a there's an article on, on sonar.freightwaves.com, and it's sort of the five commandments or the five characteristics of the best freight brokers. And this is very applicable because these five great characteristics are what going to help build your reputation. Because you can't unring the bell, but you can get further away from the echo from it. And the, the way you further yourself from that echo or you, you don't ring that bell for new customers is by providing some of these solutions. Let's start at the bottom here. Number five, the fifth commandment is they build two networks, shippers and carriers. And this is you playing the market, not just for rates, right? Not just playing it to take advantage of both sides of it when it favors you. This is you helping out the disadvantaged side during times like these. And this has been a very unique year because in a very rapid and compressed span of time, you have had the opportunity, if you didn't, if you took advantage of it, you had the opportunity to really build some strong relationships with carriers back in that March, April period, right? And now you have a great opportunity to create some relationships with those shippers where you really want their freight. You want to be a part of their RFP cycle. And the best way you can do that is to introduce them to some good service and some good capacity, building that network on both sides. And it, maybe it's not intuitive because you don't see a lot of brokers doing this enough because they're very transactionally based. We get stuck in this transactional cycle because of the rapid pull of the market. But I think you can seize these opportunities, right, Kevin? You can definitely see these opportunities. These are uh, from the five characteristics of the the best, uh, the best, five characteristics of the best freight brokers. And it's an article that I wrote on the sonar.freightwaves.com blog a, a couple weeks ago. And these apply to freight brokers and freight brokerages. So this is all for the long term. You know, and if you're building your reputation, you're building your brand, it's always for the long term. You know, there's not short term. It goes back to what you were saying just now uh, about transactional. Um, you know, each of your 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 transactions are transactional, right, in nature. Um, because basically the more loads you move, the more margin you make. But your relationships are need to be sustainable. And they are relationships. You have to build those relationships. And, and the, the fe best freight brokerages, the best freight brokers out there, they build two networks, right? It's not all about sales on the buy side or the shipper side. You have to have a lot of customers, but you also have to have great relationships with carriers to fulfill those transactions. So while it's a transactional, you know, the more transactions you, you, you do, the, the, the better off you're going to be. But on both sides of that, you have to have very deep-rooted relationships, and those relationships are based on uh, trust, integrity, honesty, ethics, you know, it's uh, it's about your reputation. Yep. Aaron Smitak says, I share pricing from the carrier with my clients so they can see exactly where my percentage is coming from. So she takes a very transparent approach. And we actually saw some people talking about this at the time when a lot of the carriers were angry. They're like, you know what? We, we, we went to great lengths to show them that we weren't putting a huge margin on this. The volume's not just there. And one of the ways you can do that in not just sharing pricing, though, is number four, it's by being that freight market expert, right? So having data intelligence, having a platform like Sonar or whatever you may be, you, what you use to glean that intelligence so you can inform the client to, and give them some context to what is happening instead of just being like, you don't want to pay it, you know, go pound sand.
You know, this is a time when you can go, hey, look, this is the, 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 the market is dictated by volume and capacity. And right now, when you're talking to shippers, that's, that's a conversation you can introduce to them when they're asking why they're getting hammered on these prices so hard. And you can show them data intelligence, like the outbound tender volume index. You show them that DHL supply chain pricing power index to allow them to build some of that trust and to give them some value back just so they kind of understand and contextualize the market. You have to understand, too, when you're talking to people, they don't know everything that you know. So you have to guide some of these conversations. What are some ways that being a freight market expert can help enhance the sales process? Exactly what you're saying. You know, you educating your customer, educating the carrier. We talked about we talked about it a little bit last week with Jake McLeod from RPM on the carrier sales side, you know, educating the carrier. You know, it's the same thing. It's showing them the data, creating the narrative, letting them know what's going on in the market, and being very honest and transparent about, about it right now. I mean, we're looking at uh, tender rejections right now of 26%. We're looking at increased load volumes uh, across the board. It's a very hot market. It's all supply and demand. It's not me wanting to raise prices. You know, if you're, if you're a freight broker doing contract loads right now, uh, you're probably underwater or pretty close to underwater if you haven't gone in for uh, a price increase right now. So it, it's explaining those nuances and uh, it really just, just like in the financial markets, you know, there's a lot of education that goes around with buying and selling stocks. So you kind of have to be that expert in the transportation market to uh, to, to educate your shippers, your, your customers and the carriers as well about what's going on in the market, what they need to do to alleviate that pain. Yeah, no, great, great points right there. Uh, Jason Eckert, he's quoting you. He says, the better brokers have relationships on both the buy and sell side. You know, one of the things that we're seeing a lot too in terms of the, the freight market experts, a lot of people using LinkedIn, using video, starting their own podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was just seeing, uh, who is it? It was Chris Seeds or someone like that. Uh, Kyle Taylor shared it. He was using some sonar. He was using a sonar chart to give context to the market. I know a lot of different people are using that as well. And again, this isn't a, a sell for sonar. It's just a great tool to give that visibility quick. There's other tools that, uh, that you can use. We just recommend mm -hmm. uh, sonar because it is the best data platform in freight, uh, in my unbiased or biased opinion. Uh, Kevin, uh, we've talked about content flywheels. We've talked about content flywheels, but you yeah. number three is build a solution flywheel. How does that work? So, so it's the same way that a content flywheel works, right? You, you're just uh, taking, you're, you're just bundling solutions, right? And and it goes to to number two is is problems or opportunities. Every problem should be an opportunity. You should love problems because they, they bring you money. And on the solution side, you build in, uh, you know, layered solutions that, that 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 don't solve one problem. They solve a series of problems, right? You, you build that flywheel where one solution you can apply two or three different different ways, and it just increases the value. And it's kind of that that you know single item versus bundling type of philosophy that, that you find in marketing as well. Is that there's the sum of the parts, right? Uh, what is that? The, the, each individual part, so there's a greater value in the sum of the parts than each individual part. So a sum of solutions yields a greater value than individual solutions that are one-off, and you learn, you, know, you learn from experience as well is how to do that. If that Great, makes Kevin, sense. Let's, lightning round, lightning round. We've got two to go through before we call out to Liz, and we only got two minutes to do it. Uh, nice placement, uh, Timothy Dooner, Kevin Carter, three. Hey, man, it's where I work. Chris Seed says, what not to miss with Chris? That's his That's his little show that he just started, or not a little show, big show, little big show he's got. And said, yeah. it's not enough to just explain what's going on in the market. It's the why that's really allowing us to have good advisory conversations right now. Couldn't agree more, Chris, because uh, one of the things you got to do, right, you got to do in this, if you really want to increase that reputation, you really want to have a non-transactional bill that you have to enjoy solving problems. That's number two on your list. 30 seconds on that, Kevin. You, you have to, problems are opportunities. And if you think problems are uh, obstacles that you can't get over, you're not going to get anywhere. Problems are strictly opportunities for the people who can find solutions for those problems. The people who find solutions for problems are the entrepreneurs, so they're the successful salespeople, they're successful in life. The, you're always gonna have obstacles. You just have to find a way around them. And the more times you find 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 yourself, you know, get around them or fail, you know, every failure is just a learning lesson. If you have that mentality, you're gonna be good. Everything's gonna so, be cool. 
Yes, cool. All right, they enjoy solving problems. And right now, shippers have a lot of problems. They're trying to find that capacity. The problem that you have, though, is a lot of brokers have, is you don't have the right freight mix. You don't have the exposure. You know, a lot of carriers, we saw that with them. They were, they were in, that, in that down market. They're getting killed. A lot of shippers don't have the right freight mix with their carrier pool right now. And they're, they're finding some lanes very, very hard to cover. But here's the thing that really keys in is, number one, and it's you're in it for the long haul. And that's how you really build a reputation is the person on the other end, on that two sides of the transaction, they feel like you're gonna be there in good times and bad. The shipper feels like you're gonna be there in, in April. The, tr the carrier feels like you're gonna be there in April. The carrier and shipper feel like you're gonna be there now. Regardless of who's on which side of the market, you are trying to build out of that transactional cycle of abuse. You're exactly right, and one of the reasons why brokers get such a bad rap sometimes, uh, that, that we're, we're scum and, and we're, we're price gougers and all that, is a lot of the people in the industry aren't in it for the long haul, right? They're, they're in it, you know, they're, they're, they're basically disconnected from their jobs. It's nine to five. They don't really want to be a freight market expert. They don't want to get better at sales. They're just in it, punching the time clock, collecting a paycheck, and those people, you know, I, every, we've all interacted uh, with them, whether whether they're on the carrier side, the freight broker side, or even the shipper side too. Uh, it, it just makes doing business that that much harder to to do, and it really gives uh, gives everyone a bad reputation. And it's, it, specifically in the freight broker world, there's there's a lot of freight brokers that are are incompetent and that they really don't seek out to become competent. They'll probably be out of the industry in the next few months. And the, the high turnover really contributes to this issue. Great, we gotta call our guest, Kevin. Uh, we're joined by Liz Wayne. She's the founder and president of Able Transport Solutions. Let's not keep her waiting as Kevin just rambles on. Let's bring her on here. Let's get her insights. Let's talk to an actual expert, Kevin. Let's do that. Sooner. Oh, hey, Liz, we gotta wait through the inspirational music. Sounds good. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Lift off! Yeah, it's Liz Lift Wayne. Off. She's we founder and president off. of Able Transport Solutions. She actually reached out to us after last week's show, and she said, I feel really passionate about this topic of improving broker uh, relations. I guess we should, should we elevate our pitch you, Liz? You can just introduce yourself right off the bat. How does that sound? Sounds great. Thank you, Dooner. My name is Liz Wayne. I founded Able Transport Solutions six years ago. We're located in Port Calhoun, Nebraska, a small town near Omaha. Our specialty is open deck and heavy haul services. We work in all sectors but have made the largest impact so far in construction, energy, and ag. We pride ourselves on providing a balance between modern technology and the old school communication our industry is still so reliant on. Abel's mission is to reinvent the reputation of the freight broker. Oh, if you'd like uh, to hear more. Uh, we're already on the ground floor. Uh, 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 uh. All right, it's up. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is the website, though? Oh, I was just going to say connect with me on LinkedIn, but uh, otherwise, abletransportsolutions.com. All right, Liz, so why did you, uh, why did you approach Kevin and I with this topic? Let's, let's kick it off. What, what makes you feel really strongly about this issue? Well, first of all, it's our mission here at ABLE. So it's something we've given a lot of thought about over the years. We're trying to consider it in every decision we make here. Um, and secondly, I just love the show. It's, uh, it's the best one I watch. So I was anxious for an opportunity to be on. Nice. That's great. That's great. So, um, uh, so, so, how long have you been? You founded Able Transportation. I, how long have you been in business? And kind of what was uh, the, the idea of uh, of your branding and your reputation going into it? And, and what was your vision? Yeah, I've been in the industry uh, for eighteen years. I have had Able for six years. Um, and really, we just see a need out here. I think you touched on it um, well, Dooner, with educating and informing the clients. Um, we saw that as a gap in the industry. Um, the industry is all I know. I've been in it for 18 years. But that was really an area we saw could be improved. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. 
So let's talk about that that unfair perception of brokers. We covered some of the terms of brokers here. The comment section was was pouring it on themselves. You know, we're, we're, and, and it's fun to laugh about, but it's but the thing is, it's actually a real issue. It's a real problem. I mean, a lot of brokers are regarded like the used car salesmen of freight. People don't want to put that trust in them. You've spent a lot of time studying this. Kevin and I just come from our own experience, the people we talk to. But when you analyze this and, you, and you're pouring into it, what are the biggest problems that you're finding with reputation and the challenge that brokers are facing to improve that? You know, I think this is really a two-part question. So on the surface, we have the issue, um, and you just kind of talked about it, you know, not everybody is in this for the long haul. Um, Maybe not everybody is interested in gaining their own knowledge and education that they can then take on and share with the clients. So I think that that brings about definitely different levels of service. The clients have received to different levels and, um, you know, the poor service obviously doesn't work for them. We've seen certain business models in our industry over the years incentivize bad business practices. Um, and, and, you know, we still kind of pay the price for that. But another thing that I don't think we can forget on this topic is, You know, there's been some fraud in our industry. I don't see as much as I used to, but there's a lot of our potential clients out here who have lost, you know, potentially years worth of profit because they had to double pay transportation invoices. Um, You know, like you mentioned, not everybody's in it forever. They, They either go out of business due to unfortunate circumstances or they were a scammer to begin with and it was always their intention. But at the end of the day, it left shippers footing the bill twice because the carrier was named on the bill of lading and able to go back and collect from them. So, you know, I think that there are some measures that were put in place to avoid those situations. And as with a lot of processes and procedures they're put in place and they're not reviewed often enough. And I think that our industry has done a hell of a job in counteracting those. I mean, um, we can issue letters of credit for shippers, uh, the insurance industry, the insurance options offered to us and to shippers have, um, you know, there's, there's more options, more readily available, more affordable that will protect them. Um, you know, the regulation, the increased bond up to $75,000. I mean, a lot of things have been put in place. And I think at some, to some extent, they have not gone back and reviewed their procedures to see is that still how we should be conducting business. So, so Liz, um, there's really good points because it's, it's like a wild, wild west. I mean, it's, it's gotten a little bit better. It gets better each year. Uh, I know when I got in, it was, I mean, there, there, there is a lot of fraud out there. There's a lot of opportunities for fraud. I think on FreightWaves.com, we write about someone embezzling money uh, at least once a, uh, once a week or once every two weeks. Uh, but but to, to get back to, to, to brokers and kind of unfair trade practices, I, we heard a lot about that. In, um, in early April from carriers who are protesting and FMC is getting the FMCSA to, to look into new regulations on, on brokers. What do you say to those uh, who, who think that freight brokerage is, is, is basically unfair or it should be eliminated or it should be heavily regulated? You know, I would disagree entirely. I think... Uh, <sighs> We're still dealing with ramifications of shutting down the supply chain due to COVID. I mean, the supply chain would shut down without brokers, and there would be consequences for years to come. Um, And obviously, you know, I think some of that that regulation and too much transparency will lead to that. Um, And, you know, besides that, Oh, man, there would be so many issues that had to be tackled to even for the, you know, if FMCSA wanted to consider the things in front of it now, which, like you said, it's crickets now. So so hopefully we're moving beyond that. But how? How would they even do it? I mean, just an example for you. You know, I'll take a project from a customer and uh, I'm going to take 20 loads, um, you know, for $30,000. And uh 
you know, what if one bill of lading has the rate on it? Then my, you know, we've got to, we've got to bring 25 motor carriers together so that we can all talk about how much we were paid on these loads and it would just never work. The the technology is not even there to make it work. Um, let alone you will, you will chase everybody out of the industry and the supply chain will slow to a crawl. Yeah. I mean, Liz, we're, we're, I mean, we're with you. The same argument we've had is the market's going to correct itself. A lot of this, these arguments are for not, and they're actually cutting your nose to spite your face for a lot of these carriers who want it. Nico Brown brings up a good point though. He says, if as a company, if you have a bunch of people on your payroll that are just there for a paycheck, then don't you deserve a subpar reputation? So this brings me to my next topic here. Are we trying to reform an entire industry here of brokers? Or are we trying to create differentiation for the good brokers or the good salespeople to utilize these skills to build those relationships? Because maybe we want some, some other brokers to have a bad reputation, don't we? You know, <laughs> um, you know, well, when I messaged you last week, I, I kind of told you some of, I understand a lot of this, right? And I think we know that there's still some brokers operating under some practices that maybe we wouldn't run our own own business on. But for that to be the overall perception is not fair because I'm seeing a lot of companies like my own that are out here doing the right thing, that are bringing the knowledge and the development to their staff um, it would be great if we could bring up the whole industry as a whole, and that'll just involve each of us, you know, focusing on, on doing the best with our own piece, I suppose. So Liz, uh, what advice would you give? Uh, you know, you, you, you built, uh, able transportation. Uh, what advice would you give uh, freight brokers, freight brokerages out there, carriers, just anyone in any business really, on how to, you know, concrete steps, processes, in how to, uh, how to increase your brand's reputation and your reputation. What do you think are like, like key elements, say three key elements for that? You know, I think um, it's very important to set the table with your prospects and clients up front. You know, um, I think that... <laughs> Many shippers would tell you they hear the same sales pitch, and you guys hit on it a lot on your show. We do everything, and we'll do it all for the best price, you know, and, and they know that's not the case. And it's a very pure form of supply and demand we're in here. So I think we have to set the table for the market almost from the first conversation. You know, they need to understand that we don't control the market. Um we can predict them to some extent, but we don't even have to be able to predict them. We have to start in those initial contacts with telling stories about the swings we've seen from the past, explain to them how our company will handle those market swings as they come up and ask for some return from them. How will they handle the market swings when they come up? Um, I think this is important not only to protect them, but to protect us as well. Um, you know, the other thing we can do, you know, for our brand and our reputation is give them some kind of guarantee. I mean, we really need to be thinking about what is the largest promise we can keep, and then we have to keep it. And, you know, we've got to think about what do they get if we don't keep it? You know, what is the guarantee we can make? I mean, I have a large customer, customer of mine that doesn't pay me when we're late, not a penny. Uh, so not only do I have to eat the margin, I have to eat the revenue, but it has led to a very strong, very long standing relationship because we understand how we're both going to handle issues as they should come up. Um, you know, and then I think the last thing is just really put yourself in their shoes, you know, and, and you talked about it last week. Don't or excuse me, a couple of weeks ago in your pitch deck show, um, don't start talking about your company and, and what you can do. Really start with figuring out what is their hesitation on brokers, you know, and is that something we can overcome with some of those things I mentioned? Liz, I have a couple here that, uh, that I want to mention. Melissa Price uh, just jogged my memory. She says part of building your brand will be consistency as well, correct? I 100% agree with her. I think that keeping your, con your, keeping your promises, being consistent, 
communication, building that social capital around your brand. But another one too is this happens a lot in brokers. You start fighting with your client, right? You're trying to like you gotta you gotta resist that urge to prove your customer wrong unless like it's necessary, unless it's an illegal arena. A lot of times you'll see you'll see brokers and they just sort of fail at this customer service point where they want to argue. With, with their clients, right? And that turns things immediately into a transactional-based relationship. But it also makes me think too. So with your, with your service, with what you guys do, I'm generic ABC broker. Do you audit us? How do you assess our reputation? And how do you help to improve that if we're coming into you just off the street? Oh, I think there's absolutely ways. And, you know, not only do I think there's ways to do it, I think it's your responsibility as the shipper. Um, anytime you're Parting with some dollars, whether as a consumer or because you're doing some procuring in a B2B situation, you should definitely be doing your homework homework, and make sure you know who you're working with. Um, so all the obvious things I talked about, you know, bond, insurance, um, not only carriers should be looking at our credit. Uh, you know, they're the only ones extending us credit, but shippers should be making sure we're financially stable and strong as well. Um, customer testimonials, you know, if, if the broker won't give you references, maybe, maybe they just got in a fight with their other customer and they don't want you calling them right now. Um, you know, I think there's lots of ways shippers can, and, and they should be doing their due diligence. Yeah, and, and, and it's very important to, to have all those expectations for the, the, the shipper side. What about the carrier side? I mean, what are some steps that, uh, that that are very important on the carrier side to develop those relationships, set expectations? What can uh, freight brokers do uh, you know, in tangible ways to, to increase those the, and deepen those relationships and, and the trust and honest integ- integrity? Yeah, you know, I think just, really thinking about them at every opportunity you can. I mean, we were no different in April. We were, you know, I almost felt bad for my employees because they're just getting an earful every time they throw a rate out there, you know? Um, But I think really just the same thing applies on the carrier side. The more we can inform and educate them, the the better they will do. Um, And so for us, it was really like, guys, the bounce back is coming. You're going to feel it soon here, and you're going to get paid a ton of money. Just bear with us here. Um, and, you know, here we see that happening. So I think just information and education is remains the best thing we can do on that side of the house as well. Now, Kevin mentioned expectations, and I think that a lot of a lot of brokers, they love to pat themselves on the back. And, and look, a lot of brokers do hard work. A lot, it can be a 24-7 job. Actually, I used to work perishable fish air freight. That was a 24 seven job. But the thing is that expectations are you covering the load. That's not you defying or going above and beyond expectations. That's just what the shipper expects out of you. So, you know, you may pat yourself on the back, but they're like, great, they're moving on to the next thing. So how do you actually defy expectations in your role as a broker? How do you cut out for just a little bit? How do you define it or defy, no, defy. it? How do you define it? How do you go above and beyond? And above and beyond is, is yep. doing more than just making sure that load is covered. Oh, it absolutely is. So, you know, we've heard it a lot, even on this show, you're only as good as your last load, right? Well, we know, um, the brokers know, if you've been in this seat, that that, that is true. And, and, and you just said it too, it can take you years to build a good reputation and, you know, one load to break it. Um, so I think it's important to persuade their perception as much as we can. So we're tooting our own horn. You know, when we go above and beyond, we're going to tell that story um, because we understand that it, that if it, if it doesn't go red, it doesn't necessarily pop up on their dashboard. And so we want to remind them that we stayed green, that we delivered on time um, and did everything they needed. But, you know, otherwise it just goes back to that what's deeper than the transactional relationship and, you know, really understanding how each of you, not just the broker, but the shipper as well, will handle situations that are common to our industry as they come up. Um, Because denying them that they're not going to come up, you know, hey, we're never going to deliver a load late. Hey, we're always going to be your lowest price. That's just not the case. That's not a promise any one of us can make knowing we're going to keep it. Um, So just honesty and, you know, setting the table and uh, 
you know, really getting to know them on a deeper level so you know what above and beyond is to them. Hey, this is a question. Oh, this is a question for all of you. It's from Jason Eckert in the comments, but it's a really good one. It says, guarantees are a key element to your value proposition. How many brokers have a guarantee they can lead with? Kevin, what does that mean to you? A guarantee? I, I think I, I was taught not to guarantee anything. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, because we, we're not really in, in control. I mean, but what you, what you can guarantee, and this is what I guarantee, and I was, I was going to ask this question as well uh, to, to, to everyone, is one of the things I learned as a freight broker, probably the most important thing maybe, is delivering bad news. I learned how to deliver bad news. It was like an art form, it turned out to be, because every time I touched anything, it'd just go wrong. You know, late pickups, late deliveries, uh, you know, uh, you know, trailers getting confiscated by the Mexican customs authorities, uh, uh, you know, damaged product. Uh, you, you know, as a freight broker, you deliver bad news every single day and being very open, honest, transparent. You either learn how to do it or you don't. And it kind of goes into to the whole honesty and, and guaranteeing thing. The one thing you can guarantee, I think, is to be able to communicate as fast as possible, especially bad news. You agree yeah. with that? Liz, you agree Liz? with that? Yes, I do. That is certainly one thing every broker should be able to guarantee. Yeah, that's one thing my dad always taught me. He was he worked for, for Roanoke Insurance. He was vice president of sales over there, very successful in, in that role. And the first thing he ever taught me in sales was don't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid to tell someone bad news. Be afraid to let someone down. So letting someone down is not delivering them that news and having them find out when they're expecting something to happen because you have that anxiety. You want you want to avoid that conflict. But I can tell you that the punch in the face you receive, you know, when when they when they are blindsided, then they have to go tell their boss that something's not showing up because you gave them no window, you gave them no chance to, to buffer, to mitigate that blow. That's what the real problem is. You know, Trey Griggs, he brings up a point here too. And this is part of adding value. He says, customer testimonials and that's social capital. Customer testimonials are so underutilized. A customer's recommendation is gold and is something to be desired through constant performance and an internal effort to build solid, long-lasting relationships. And I highly agree with this. And, and this is something we promote on here a lot is that content marketing, making that, that content flywheel, doing these podcast interviews, right? Uh, uh, writing these articles, writing these blogs, but then, then sharing them. So many of these companies, you go on their website and they have, they have blogs on there. They've done podcast interviews. Their sales reps don't leverage it, right? Or, or they don't, but the, they don't make their own versions of it and have their own, uh, have their own case studies with their clients. If you have the right relationships, these shouldn't be that hard to do. Realtors do actually, in a, the best realtors do an amazing job of this on digital. If you go looking for a house and you want to find a good realtor, look at some of the testimonials they put out there of like happy families buying houses and stuff. I'm always impressed at what they're doing in that game. And I think it's because they got to fight for every penny because they're, you know, they're only paid on commission. Liz, what do you think about all that in terms of content marketing and building value and uh, personalizing uh, yourself within a company? Yes, I think that's very important because, you know, we buy people, right? We buy individuals because we can relate to them. They struck a chord with us, whatever the case might be. I think customer testimonial, testimonials are crucial. And I, I would agree with the commenter that they're very underutilized. But, you know, prospects don't care what we say. They don't, you know, they don't care. Um, you guys have talked about this a whole lot, but they can relate to that other shipper. They know that other shipper has had the same challenges as them. Um, and so they would just rather hear it from them than us. So I agree that they are invaluable. And I agree with Trey. He says they're, they're, they're way underutilized, especially in freight brokers, which, which everyone's so paranoid about other freight brokers poaching, the, the, their shippers. The, they're all, you know, all these other freight brokers are calling your, your customers anyway every single day. They're pounding the phone. They're pounding the emails, uh, trying to get in the door. And, but if, if you don't have a good enough relationship, uh, you should have a good enough relationship with your customers <clears throat> that, that you would share their name, their, their phone number with any competitor because basically they're calling them anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, and, and you're going to face that competition. And if you're not doing the, the, the service levels and, and what you need to do to retain that, that customer, then they're, they're lost anyway. 
you got to take the good with the bad too, right? I mean, part of building a reputation is taking that feedback, right? Putting, you love doing surveys, Kevin, and getting information, getting that market intelligence. And, you know, sometimes the bad reviews you get back can be the most telling, right? I, exactly right. The, 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 you learn the most by, you know, just like anything else, you learn the most by failing. And in your failures, you can either learn from them or you can uh, sink away from them. And, you know, it, it, that, that changes the course of your future. What do you think, Liz? Do you have do you have feedback as a part of your your reformation process you're doing here for brokers? And those of you in the comments, what is part of your reformation process? Maybe you don't have one yet for your for your own uh, for your own reputation building. You're just developing it now. But if you do, share in the comments. We're happy to hear them. But Liz, what do you think about the whole feedback? No, we do try to get feedback through customer surveys, and I would agree with Kevin. It's the negative feedback that we're looking for. Um, because those are the things that um, just when you talked about, you know, it being hard to deliver bad news. Well, that's a innate human characteristic. So the shippers have it, too. So they're not necessarily bringing. Um, now, in the heat of the moment, if you really drop the ball, they're going to let you have it. But a lot of things they also hold inside and don't share with us. So we find it um, a good opportunity for them to kind of anonymously, you know, share some things. And it's definitely the areas of improvement that we're looking for in those. Um, Because when they're happy, you know, no news is good news, right? So that's what we're looking for. And uh, I think that's important that everybody is out there looking for feedback. I, I really liked what you said about you know, brokers being hesitant to share their, their customer. Um, and that, that is funny to me too, because you're 100% right. The competition's knocking on their door all day, every day anyway. So the credibility that you can gain with your prospects may be worth it there. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Excellent point. Uh, we, we do have to uh, let you go, but you get about 30 seconds. Anything we missed today? Uh, wh- where should people go after this? That kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, to learn more about ABLE, our website's abletransportsolutions.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. And, you know, if there's any shippers listening, just reevaluate your perception of freight brokers, uh, because every shipper should have a good broker among their service providers and a good broker should feel like an asset to you. I tell you, yeah, exactly. excellent. I'll give you a little, uh, I'll give you a little bell for that. I got to punch it with the hand though. I don't have my my beater nearby. But there you go, Liz. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And thanks for reaching out. Those of you there, if you have a great show idea, right? And you you get something you really want to speak to, don't hesitate to reach out to Kevin Hill or I. We're very approachable gentlemen. Thank you, Liz. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, excellent stuff out of Liz. I mean, um, I guess my only counter to her argument would be that yeah, it's great for brokers to improve their perception, but if I'm a broker, I don't want every broker to improve their perception. I want to differentiate myself by being the better broker. I want to defy those perceptions by by using these sort of examples because I can't fix an entire industry anyway. No, but but we can hope that the floor kind of raises, right? There's going to be a floor no matter what. I, I wish in freight brokers the floor was a little bit higher than it is to, to today, but you're exactly right. That's how you differentiate yourself. You go that, that the extra mile. You know, that there's that there's countless, uh, countless memes and, and quotes about going that extra mile, and uh, that's how you differentiate, differentiate yourself. I can't even say it. <laughs> Melissa Price says, uh, right. yes, quite... Qu- Quite often, our organization creates wins from testimonials. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, testimonials underutilized. The other thing that I think is underutilized because people are sometimes afraid to ask is for those those referrals. And I think those referrals go both ways. You have a good relationship with your shipper. And look, every broker, look, not everybody is great at every service in every lane. If you've got friends at another brokerage, they can cover the lane better. You know that they're going to get better service. Don't and you know you don't want to damage your brand. It's. I think it's okay sometimes to do those recommendations, especially if you have a good relationship and you can have you a great relationship with some honesty. You should. If you study the, the the highest performers, that's what they do. They they refer people that they can't really help, even competitors, and they build a, a relationship with that because there's again, you know, you have to dominate a niche. You can't be all things to everybody. But if you can help people out, you know, pay it f- forward almost, right? Uh, or maybe that's what it is. Pay it forward, and and those th- those relationships and, and those good deeds will come back to you at some day. You maybe not tomorrow, maybe not the next day, but if you're in it for the long haul and that's what you consistently do, uh, th- those will pay off in the end. 
You know, as a broker, it's tough. You mentioned those guarantees. Uh, Evan Korn and Aaron Smitak talk about two ways that you go, you know what, of the things I can control, this is what I can guarantee, and that is good communication so the customer is informed and I can aid in problem solving they may need or want. And Aaron says, you can guarantee excellent customer service. It can be tough as a broker, right? Because you may not, if you're working with a carrier, you know, you hope they do a great job. They're in your network. You can make proactive actions if they if they have a service failure with the shipper and those kind of things. But while the goods are in transit, there's little you can do other than communication and that good customer service. So of course, those are always areas where you control the most is your customer service and your communication. Communication above all else, Kevin, I think my dad and you said it perfectly and don't be afraid to deliver the bad news, especially if you can be incredibly proactive about it and you can get ahead of it. This is freight. Everybody knows things happen, but nobody wants to be blindsided. Yeah, everyone has to answer to somebody. Your shipper has to answer to their customer. So you don't want to uh, to, to blindside them because that will really hurt your reputation. With them, like Brent Orsuga we had on a few weeks ago, you know, you know, it was all about sales, but it's uh, about you know, your guarantees as well, you know, it's what you can control. And that's your activity and your attitude. And it goes uh, with with this topic hand in hand. Let's get a little shout outs here. Charlie to honey. He says, boom, that's Charlie. Big money to honey to you, Kevin Hill. Catherine Whitehouse said, uh, can't wait for for this one. I hope she's uh, I hope she's enjoying it. Aaron said she was looking forward to this one. Nicole Glenn, what a true statement, Kevin Hill. Looking forward to this show. I'm not sure exactly what statement you made. I think that's in reference to your video. Uh, Nick so. Romer, he says, you are your brand and you are your brand's reputation. That means yet your company's reputation equals you. Yes, you are a front person, right? You are that you are that front line. Our guest from last week, Jake McLeod, great episode. If you ever want to go to our back episodes, you can go to freightwaves.com slash podcast. They're all there. You have the option of video or audio. Obviously, you can subscribe to this show. If you go to Freightcast, you get every Every single Freightways podcast, if you look up Freightcast. But if you only want put that coffee down, because on Freightcast, there's about four podcasts a day that are put up there. Maybe that's a little too much freight content for you. Fine. So be it. Just go to put that coffee down. You can get this a la carte, baby. We got, uh, what do we have, like 30 some odd back episodes. You can check them all out. Jake McLeod is one of those guests. He says, try to tell folks this all the time. Looking forward to the topic. Don't see bro- brokers protesting outside the White House for lower carrier rates, though. I don't know. Have you seen any, Kevin? I, I haven't seen any. I, I, I don't know the reason why. Maybe maybe because we're just desk jockeys. I, I don't know. Um, but, <laughs> you know, the, the market goes up, the market goes down. We don't control the market. Carriers don't control the market. Shippers don't control the market. It's all about supply and demand. And the more you communicate that out to, to everyone, especially your customers and to carriers as well, the better off you'll be. Kevin, let's roll for a book here. What book are we giving away this week? Do uh, Mr. Supply Chain's book. He sent us a bunch of copies, so I'm just going to give them out, give them out, give them out. And it's a okay. supply chain for dummies, Daniel Stanton. All if right. you don't follow <laughs> Mr. Supply Chain on LinkedIn, go do it right now. Daniel Stanton. And the winner is number 60. Who's number 60? Who's number 60 on this list? Number 60 would be none other than Brandon Dawson. Brandon Dawson. He is the uh, the dragon of freight sales, he calls himself. And now he has Mr. Supply Chain's book. Wow. He like does. Pro here. We're like pro wrestlers. <laughs> we all have our own, our own nicknames. What we got to do, though, one day is we got to get our two sales pro wrestlers on this show. We can have people we back in person. to ring up and we can have... Uh, we can have uh, what's it called? Uh, Matt Ironside versus uh, <laughs> Matt Henning. We can have the two the two boys just take it out, yeah. right? I, I think that'd be an excellent episode. We can do a little trash talking. We can do, do a little pro wrestling. It'll be just like the WWE or is it WWF? I, I think they had changed the name, right? WWE. Uh, yes. Yeah, like, yeah. Only like twenty years ago, Kevin. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I used to watch it as a kid. <laughs> All right. Uh, they're actually doing the best fan experience in the game right now. They have like uh, yeah, they are. They, stadium seating. They have like all these just zoom windows, right? They're just like windows of people watching. But in wrestling, part of the fun is like the people watching. So you can make fun of the people oh, yeah. watching. No fans there. Myself as a wrestling fan, I would have to watch. And the only fan I could make fun of was myself. So I'm glad they put other people in the audience so they can distract me from my own ire. And I can actually enjoy the show as it's meant to be. Exactly right. I mean, I, I haven't followed wrestling in a, in a few years, but as a kid, I, I loved wrestling before they rolled it all up. You know, Mid-South Wrestling, I used to watch that every Saturday or Friday night whenever it came on. It was it was great. Oh, Fantastic that was like a deep That had great fan watching, that kind of that kind of oh, did, WCW yes. did too. And I loved when Bobby the Brain Heenan 
join that network because you would just sit there and just make fun of the crowd the entire show. It was beautiful. I know. It was great. They had great announcers. It's great entertainment. It really is. And it is real. It is real. Yeah, sure. You get injured all the time. It, it, it's, it's hard. Stuff. And by the way, when you're there's like this documentary that's out right now. Uh, David Arquette. So he was he had this movie called Ready to Rumble in like 2000-ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2001. Yeah. Yeah, and the WCW gave him the title, and it, it angered so many people. It got them so upset that he had the title, that, and he, he hasn't lived it down for his entire life. So they just put out this documentary where he had the urge to get back in the ring, and he had to go on the independent circuit. And the independent circuit is much different than the WWE. I'm talking about, like, mm-hmm. wrestling in backyards, death matches where people are sticking, uh, like, uh, what's it called, fluorescent lights in your neck. This actually happened yeah. to him. He ended up in the hospital and almost died. Wow. That yeah. is insane. <laughs> okay so so we are out of time and i've been told to wrap right now so at now. timothy dooner on twitter at kevin hill cl follow us on linkedin kevin hill timothy dooner that's d-double-o-n-e i got friends only want to talk business i got expensive because when is expensive yeah. i got expensive because when is expensive i've been reading all the work and i've been shutting down the stars yeah. And I'm ready for some more.